my email just really wants to be seen right now. <laughs> All right, um, so welcome everyone um, to, I'm so excited for you to join us today. This is Exceptional Children for Exceptional Learners. I'm just gonna stop sharing for a second since my computer's not cooperating. Um, and I'm very excited today because we are recording live on, we're recording and we're also live on Facebook. Um, we have several people in the audience here today um, that I've been able to reach out to um, through Council for Exceptional Children, as well as um, the colleagues of Mr. Johnson here today. So, um, once again, I'm Rebecca Muller, um, and this is a part of the Learning Revolution series of taking care of educational circumstances that have arise due to COVID-19. Um, exceptional Circumstances for Exceptional Learners focuses specifically on the special needs of students during this time. Um, so, yeah, I am so excited to introduce Jay. Um, Jay Johnson and I um, were able to connect through the Council for Exceptional Children. Um, and what was great about that is um, it's all about building community right now. Um, nobody has all of the answers. Um, in fact, we're figuring out some of the questions as we, we go as well. Um, so to be able to bridge the gaps and to come together uh, to brainstorm is just so fundamentally important right now. Um, so yeah, um, I would love to introduce um, Jay. Uh, tell us a little bit more about where you're coming to us from, um, your position, and um, we'll go from there. Wonderful. Well, thank you, for Rebecca, for having me here today. Um, my name is Jay Johnson. I am the director for itinerant services here in Arizona. I work for an organization that's called the Arizona School for the Deaf and the Blind. While we have two ground campuses, one in Tucson, which is a school for the deaf and a school for the blind, and we have a ground campus in Phoenix, which is a school for the deaf, my work is on the itinerant service side, which means I get to work statewide with just over 200 school districts and charters and we provide the services to those school district charters who are unable to have their own staff to provide service to kids who with sensory impairments. So our staff comes in and provides those services um, to the just over, like I said, 200 school districts and charters. We have roughly about 1,200 students on our caseload and about 150 total staff members within the co-ops. And we have three regions to the state. One is the northern part of our state in the Sedona area in Flagstaff. And that region curves around through Lake Havasu down to Yuma. Then we have a second region of the state that's in the Phoenix area and encompasses Maricopa County, our largest county by population in the state. And then we have our southeast regional co-op and that's in the Tucson or Pima County, so the southern part of Arizona. And those three groups work together um, to provide services for kids that have some sort of sensory impairment. And that's the work that I get to do. That's wonderful. Um, so I love that this was a part of your presentation because while we're all go, going through this, it looks very different if you are blind, if you are hard of hear, hearing, um, on, um, you know, for everyone, this has been such a challenging time, but how have you been able to really make sure that all the students got what they needed um, now that we are, teaching on Zoom, in our house, um, in all the, diff the, the different ways. Um, you know, what did that look like for you 
when the pandemic started, you know, kind of what was the journey? Um, and I would love to hear about that because it's all been um, so trying for so many of us. Yeah, and that's a great question because I think we've all been put into this role um, in some cases immediately after coming back from spring break um, last spring, as well as coming into the fall semester in that virtual environment. One positive thing with ASTB is we had already started a distance learning program and it was in its pilot year and we were utilizing Zoom to provide remote services to some of the more rural parts of our state that it was very difficult to get staff members there. It might have been like a four hour trip there and back and providing service for 20 minutes, half hour. It obviously enables us to provide more services for kids in rural communities doing it virtually than in person. So we already had that pilot project going. So when the pandemic happened, all of our staff were quickly trained on how to use Zoom. So that was our main platform that we utilize. But a lot of our school districts and charters chose to use Google Meets. So through either one of those platforms, we were able to provide services to kids during the pandemic and then going into the fall semester. One thing that has been shared with our board um, and our superintendent is during the pandemic, we serviced about 85% of our total student population in the co-ops. The remaining 15%, um, in some cases, parents were refusing services because of family concerns that were going on um, or one thing or another had happened that we've tracked. But when we started looking at over 85% of our population that was still able to receive services through the month of April and May, we felt very proud about that and knowing that we were able to give those services statewide um, with all the students that were there. So that's the one thing that I found um, very prideful um, with the work that we do. And as we've kind of found out today, ASDB as a group is a very close knit family, I would say. And there might be chocolate involved sometimes to make sure that we help each other out a little bit. Um, but we respond very quickly um, when there is a need as in with this um, presentation today, as well as what our schools come to us at. Um, I do have an example I can share with the group if that would be appropriate. Yeah, well, I just wanna share the example that you're referring to. So um, through um, the Council for Exceptional Children, I had posted that this event was going to happen tonight. And one of the members here reached out to me and said, are you going to have um, closed captioning or an interpreter? And it gave me pause because here I'm giving this event in order to talk about how we're going to provide the services for the children. And I didn't think to, you know, find the resources. Um, so I reached out to a colleague in pure panic, Deb here. I said, Deb, I don't know what to do. Like, I, 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 I didn't think about it. And she's like, well, why don't you reach out to the presenter tonight? So I did. I said, Jay, I, you know, what can we do? And literally within the hour, within the hour, he was able to find the interpreters here that we have tonight. So Christina and Lisa, I am just so amazed at the quickness. Um, and that's what this is all about, right? It's that community. We are not an island. And like for me today, I didn't know that this was something I needed to do because I've never had to do it before, right? We can all relate to that somehow when it comes to COVID. We're all doing things that we've never had to do before. And how do you get that done? You're not an island. You have to reach out to your community um, and people come, come together. And I'm seeing a lot more than that than anything else. And that just gives me so much hope um, and really just makes these times... Uh, much brighter. So um, I am happy that uh, Jay will be providing you with chocolate from this amazing chocolate <laughs> clean that's out there in Arizona. But um, I too will be um, doing something because it just is, uh, it, words are not enough. <laughs> so
so, but um, feel free to share your other egg, egg, example, Jay. Yeah. So just to make sure we give credit where credit is due, it was really me reaching out to our director over deaf education, um, as well as reaching out to our interpreters here today. And they are really the ones who did step up for us um, in a very short notice. Um, and just so you do know, Rebecca, I had three different other groups that were gonna come up and provide service as well outside of ASDB. Um, because the one thing that we pride ourselves in Arizona uh, the kind of the joke we have is Arizona is amazing, you know, with the AZ in the middle, because right. we're not okay, like Oklahoma, but, um, okay. right. you know, but that's okay. I mean, nothing against Oklahoma folks, but um, so that's, we, we do feel like we have an amazing group of educators in our state that can respond very quickly. Yeah, um, I mean, I feel like that is pretty unique. Um, the only connection I have is with um, the organization like the Council for Exceptional Ch Children. Um, we really came together this past summer with the Legislative sum Summit um, and getting together and trying to advocate for all the, the HEALS Act. And there was just um, a bill that, that came through to provide more and money for um, the IDEA. But I feel like there's maybe I don't know, 10 of us right now. And our state is much bigger than 10 individuals in the field of, of special ed. So I feel like whatever you all have going on is special and I want to hear about it and learn about it and see how we can take a morsel of, of that and um, spread, spread it around. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so in Arizona, our a AZ case and AZCAC are also very active in the state. And they've been holding their own webinars or meetings on Saturday mornings and, you know, coffee and meeting uh, colleagues to talk a lot. And they've done a lot of that as a grassroots efforts within the state, which has kind of bound ourselves together um, with that. And then the other piece to remember with ASDB co-ops, not only are we a part of that AZKs, AZCC, but when we're talking about working with over 200 districts and charters, that means we have over 200 special education directors we're working at with the state on a daily basis. In addition to that, we have true partnerships with our VR colleagues um, in Arizona. We have a region that specifically provides services through VR for kids that are either deaf or hard of hearing, as well as blind or visually impaired. So we partner our work very closely with that unit from VR in addition to other units within the state from Raising Special Kids, which is a resource for parents to receive support if they have a child with special needs, um, working of course with DDD, um, the Arc of Arizona, and several others. It's really a community effort. And we have several communities of practice that we have um, in our state that are not only the state level community of practice, but also local community of practices. So for instance, I was the call before I had on this one was a call I had with the community practice in Pima County, which again is in the southern part of Arizona. And that group comes together to talk about transition planning throughout the entire county and how do we support each other. So you may have 10 organizations and 20 schools all on the same call, really talking about how do we provide service for kids, as well as looking at our specific population of kids with sensory impairments. Yeah. So um, let's talk, uh, you know, specifics. So I heard a little bit about the difference between Zoom and Google. What is working well? <clears throat> what do you suggest? Um, <laughs> and I guess what have been some of the roadblocks that you were able to navigate around? Yeah. Well, obviously, if we're talking about students with sensory impairments, we may have some students that have both impairments, right? We may have a student with low vision who's also deaf. Um, this happened in a case in Arizona that we had a special ed director um, just after the pandemic, when we knew the academic year was starting online, came in and said, Jay, we have no way to provide service for this, this student that's there. And we talked a lot about on the phone and then what we did is we logged in on two separate computers where she was and I was, and we both logged in to Zoom, the, obviously the application we're using now, 
as well as Google Meets. And what we were able to figure out that to, in order to provide service for the student, we were going to have the interpreter log into both platforms and the student log into both platforms, but only use Zoom for the visual of interpreting back and forth. And then the classroom teacher was going to be in the Google Meets along with our student and the interpreter. So the interpreter could hear in real time from the classroom teacher, the student who has enough vision that could see the interpreter on a larger screen now, as well as the classroom teacher and was able to see what was going on in the classroom as well as classmates on um, what was shared and see the interpreting service at the same time. And the only thing we had to do after that was get a second monitor um, for the student to make sure that it was going to work out those type of things. And we worked on that from about five till 630, believe it or not, trying to figure out the different applications and what would work and not work and without too much feedback on things. Um, and by 630 that night, the next day, we were training all staff um, at the school, as well as the staff from ASDB coming in. And by the end of that afternoon, it was in practice and already being provided services with that. So it was less than a 24 hour um, roll around from concept to application. So that's it's a so incredible. That is so incredible. And that's, you know, when we have these circumstances, whatever they may, may be, right? Innovation is what is going to make the difference because we could have said, oh, we can't do it. I don't know. There's no way to do it and been done. And that's just not acceptable, especially in the field of education as a whole, but for special ed, right? And it's just so, I can't even put into words how encouraging and um, uplifting it is to know the amount of work. Because from, I mean, so we first spoke um, August 10th to kind of see, okay, you know, what are you about? And let's just chat. And so much has happened since then. Um, I know you said that your facilities are m moving. Um, so not only are you trying to get kids, are they coming back into the building or are they not? We're moving build buildings, right? And it's just, it's just so amazing to know that what's the word right now? Pivot, right? You're able to pivot on this small dime to be able to say, we're going to get what these kids need. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is just amazing. Um, our district had a professional development this past week. Um, and, uh, Cornelius minor, if you're not familiar with, with his work does a lot with, um, racial inequities and, um, the literacy he's an educator out of brooklyn and um his he was explaining that in his district they were giving out com com computers and he deals with some students that are hard of hearing so apparently the newer apple did a better job with the closed cap captioning than the older model so as the people were lining up to get their devices, he was making sure that the computers that could do the closed captioning were put aside for the students that he knew needed it the most. And he explained in an anecdote about how one of the parents was like, but, but I want the newer one. She's like, well, your son, daughter is not hard of hear hearing, right? The whole idea that equal isn't necessarily the equity piece, right? So you need to make sure that everybody is getting what they need so that we're all on the same level. Right. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of images out there um, with like people and reaching up for an apple, right? And if one person's short, you're not just gonna have them struggle the entire time. They're gonna get a ladder to get right. the apple or there's going to be some sort sort of support there um and the technology right now like i'm so grateful to hear that you already had some of that in in place because i can't imagine what it would be like and i'm sure there's some places this is all new this is all fresh <laughs> um so you know i feel like this has catapulted us into the 21st 
century, if you were a little bit reluctant to get on board, um, you know, you really don't have a choice. But I want to talk about that in lines with what that means for the um, blind and the deaf community. Um, what other technologies besides Google and Zoom are out there? Um, you know, how have you been providing um, the quality of education that they would get if they were in the classroom? Or perhaps if they were in the classroom, what are you doing? Because I'm assuming there's some and people that aren't aware. If you've never had a student that had that disability, you might have not had to think about it. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a lot that's out there and, you know, we're all familiar with JAWS and, and some of those applications that are there too. So we use a lot because we are a Google-based platform, even though we do use Zoom, we use a lot of Google products um, for our students, which are a multitude that we could do a whole session just on what we utilize um, with those Google extensions. But also remember, if we're talking about a student just with low vision, it may be so simplistic on not giving a child something that's all in red ink because they can't see it or thinking about instead of putting it in 12 inch font it's now in 48 inch font or there's a lot of those accommodations that we're constantly advocating for our students in the general ed curriculum and in sometimes in the special ed curriculum too and you know when you were talking earlier about access Arizona is a very diverse state. Um, we have Phoenix as the mass majority of our population is in the Phoenix metropolitan area. So when you think about population, there are about half the population we have that are more in a rural area of the state. One of the most rural areas is going to be the Navajo Nation in northern Arizona. And I'm sure many people remember that nationally, that nation had more coronavirus cases per capita than anywhere else in the United States. So some of our schools in that part of the state had made the decision early on that they were gonna go virtual this entire year, even way back in May had made that decision. Well, being very rural, there was an internet available to all folks. And we have some children that live up there in that part of the nation without running water, with electricity, there's no electricity those type of things. And as I mentioned before, we have two ground campuses that normally provide services in person. And those students that normally would have come to Tucson to live on campus were still at their home up in the, the nation. And one of our students that was up there could not get internet at his house for whatever reason it was, actually would get on his ATV and his Chromebook in hand, would drive over to the local McDonald's get on their Wi-Fi there to basically log into class and do the assignments and then ride the ATV home. That's, I, I think that's the, the grit really with Arizona. We all find a way, right, to do that. And that works for that one student. But the other thing I have to give a lot of kudos to is our school districts and charters out there. Many of them either applied for grants or scholarships to provide hotspots in areas. We had a local organization that put towers up in places that didn't exist in Arizona. There was, everyone really pulled together um, for that. And one of the local organizations even sent out a map of Arizona that showed where all the free Wi-Fi was in Arizona. So if folks don't have internet at their house, they were able to go to somewhere in their neighborhood to get on that free Wi-Fi at a local library or whatever it may be. The other thing that I wanna make sure I make note of is the Arizona Department of Education that oversees all of our work in Arizona was almost immediately supportive with the pandemic. I'm gonna share my screen um, so you can kind of see the page that they designed for the state that all folks can have access to. And I think it's in your slides as well, but this page was basically designed and developed in less than a month um, the Arizona Department of Ed came together and said, what is it that we can really help out our community of learners, as well as family members too? And what they did is they built this page that has a few different talking points that are on here. You can see from visual supports to transition even, communication, speech therapy, all different types of things. And the one thing that I wanna point out as well, 
they were actually talking about fun things for student engagement. It wasn't all about compliance. It wasn't all about just provide the service you're supposed to provide school districts and charters. Um, so each one of these actually opens up to its own page. So if I clicked on literacy, what they did there is now all the literacy links come up on the different things that I could be utilizing as a classroom teacher or as a parent in Arizona for the different things that are on there. You were mentioning some of the applications we may use for students that may be either deaf, hard of hearing or blind, low vision. The read aloud would be a perfect one for that for our students with low vision and unable to read the text that are there. So there's all types of things that they provided. And this is just one of the many pages that's on there as it relates to literacy. Because as we know, literacy is the foundation to all the work that we do to make sure we give kids the best opportunity, especially with transition planning and moving on to adult education or adult projects that might be going on. We wanna make sure we give them a strong foundation there. And then the other thing that the Department of Ed has done is they've held uh, weekly meetings and these meetings have been set up open-ended that anyone can come to and they've broken it down by literacy. So there's a literacy specialist in one group. They have mathematics specialists, they have transition specialists, early childhood specialists, and they were able to come together as teams and even put office hours online. So if someone was looking for something, I don't know what to do this, how do I reach this child? You could connect to somebody at the Arizona Department of Ed and they would connect you to a local resource or whatever might be happening or even just being someone to listen to and saying, I'm frustrated, I don't know where to go next. So that the ADE has been amazing support systems for all the work we're doing. So that's why I'm here. Because came right at May, nobody was talking about next year. It was silence. And I just felt like there ha I know I'm not the only person that is thinking this, but it felt that way, right? Because you you tend to just kind of gather in your own community. Everybody was just kind of, well, let's just wait and see. And there was a part of me saying, no, 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 we have to put our resources together. There has to be a place for people to go. My very first ep episode was um, about those who are medically fragile because there were just so many things. Nurses couldn't come into the homes. They weren't getting the therapies. Forget the math, forget the reading. It was more about survival. And, um, you know, I just started to reach out to my, my network um, and eventually found Learning Revolution. And um, it's just so inspiring um, to hear this because it's a wonderful model. There is so much out there that it's overwhelming. I know I would be on the Facebook pages trying to gather the information and I've made some um, like collective documents that people have added to um, just because everybody's searching right now. We're searching for the best way and in special education specifically, what's best for one kid might not be best for another. So you even have to search even further. You have to keep going and you can feel very alone in that process if, you know, because even the parents right now, they need a break. They need some, someone to, um, to get on, on board and, and to give them ad, 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 ad advice. Um, it's just such a, um, a unique time. So I was like, well, I don't know how to put together a website. I'm just one person. I don't know and what to do, but like, that's what I like envisioned. What you just shared is the thing that was keeping me up at night. Cause I said, there has to be some sort of collaborative thing. We're all in the same boat. Why isn't it happening? Um, and it's interesting to me to like, know, like, you know, is it your leadership? Is it just a couple of individuals? Do you feel like everybody's on on board? Like I I I, I just want to take a bit of whatever is going on there and and <laughs> bring it to the East Coast. Yeah, you know, it's I don't think there's a simple answer for that, and I think it is really a collaborative effort. As I mentioned, there's so many groups, and 
There are many others that I don't have time today to kind of go into, but when we start looking at, it's that connection, right? The connection that we need to have within one organization to another to make sure those services are being provided and the things that are there. So when I mentioned with ADE pulling together, they obviously were in the same condition we were all in and saying, well, what do we do to support our schools? So they internally came up with that webpage and said, we're going to do this and we're gonna build this. And then they pushed it out to all special education directors in our state. So we all would have access to that and guidance and some additional guidance pieces, which you know, are separate than what the things we're talking about today. Um, so that's been one thing that's on there. The other piece is we've had many, many community of practices going on where we're able to share those type of resources. So let's just say I'm a brand new director um, in a region. And this happened today. I was on a different call with Yavapai County, which is closer to the northern part of our state. And there was a young man that was on there as a first year special education director. And we were talking about the things that were going on introducing ourselves. And he said, I'm a new director and I'm struggling. I'm not sure where to go and I'm not sure where to start. And I immediately said, well, you know, our AZ case group has a new special ed director induction courses that they're putting together and meetings and support system. He had no idea existed. So I was able to connect him then to the president of AZ case. And now he's going to have that support system. And it's that connections that we're making with that too. I think the other piece that you kind of hit on a little bit is this idea of self care. Um, if we're doing so much all the time and the things that are going on and constantly searching until midnight every night and then getting up at five the next morning to start planning for lessons and providing support, we're going to burn ourselves out. So one thing that ASDB really took the lead on in our organization was what kinds of things can we provide to all staff to really help with self-care and really looking at educator self-care that's on there. I'm going to share my screen again to one of the resources that we started putting together. And this is a, a, like a line of page. It's a sticky note page, basically, that um, if you go to this page, there's a little hand that kind of comes up with your mouse and you can grab it um, by holding down your, um, on mine, it's my keyboard that I'm holding down. But you can move the page around and see different resources. Some people like to do that. And some people just like to use their arrow keys to move down. And so you can do that as well. Uh, mine is not cooperating right now, so I apologize, but you can move it that way too. But what we started to do is starting to build some resources here that staff could use as educator resources that it comes specifically for self-care. One of the first ones you'll see on here is a video collection. And this comes from the National Deaf Center, um, which we're also connected with. And they're a national organization but our VR counterparts and ASDB are actually part of a project that they're looking at and called um, Engage the Change to really look at how do we increase outcomes for individuals who are deaf, hard of hearing after high school. So that's the work that we've been doing there. What this video collection is, is basically success stories of people overcoming challenges to meet that success. And sometimes that's all we need as an educator, knowing that this work has true meaning that's there. And there's other times we may have to think about our own routine, or there's headspace that's on here, a lot of different ones that are there too. The other two videos that are on here, oops, um, sorry about that. The video that's here about the blind machinist, he is a individual who's totally blind who was the first person on earth to travel 150 miles an hour unassisted. So again, another inspiring story wow. that kids can overcome challenges, right? The one I love to share is the one that's on the left-hand side here, and it says, my dad, Matthew. Matthew is a full-time professor at Northern Arizona University, and he also happens to be um, physically disabled. He's wheelchair bound. He's nonverbal. Um, so he has, you can see in the picture there, and if you click on the video, if you want to go back to it at some point, he has a bicycle helmet with a pointer and uses a communication board to lecture his classes. Um, so again, if we're looking at overcoming challenges, to me, he is the perfect example nationally for that. And they made a short little video about him on there too. So again, it's not just what do we do on this daily kind of occurrence, 
But when we need that inspiring story or we need somebody to go, there are things that look, the people out there that look just like my kid or just like my student who overcame their challenges and how do we build that in for any student to meet their goals um, during and after the K-12 experience. So that's one of the things that we did um, with that. Transition is such an important one. And I, I think too, our world is changing. Um, things that we were getting people ready for back in 1960 look a little bit different right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I wonder how the world is going to change as far as people working from home more often. Is that going to be the norm? Are we ever going to go back? Um, you know, and what type of jobs and roles that um, incorporate? Um, the other thing that I'm thinking about is how long are we going to actually wear the masks? Because what I've noticed, even with myself, I rely on reading lips a whole bunch because I've had to ask many and people to repeat them, them themselves because I'm not hearing people as, as clear, you know? Um, so has there been, uh, do you have some districts that are in person right now? How are the teachers adapting that? Because I, you know, of course they have the interpreters, but you know, so much of it is also lip. Mm -hmm reading. So uh, can you tell me a little bit about what that looks like? Yeah. So can, before I go into that, um, I also want to let you know that Amazon became one of our partners this year and they donated 5,000 shields to ASDB. Wow. Um, so they're full shields that come all the way down to almost the collarbone. Um, so with those shields, our superintendent decided that we wanted to get them out to all of our co-op students um, within the state which again, they're scattered from the very far north to the very south and east and west. But in addition, she also wanted to make sure we were able to provide this with our partnering schools. So what we did is we contacted all of our special education directors and said, we've got this donation. How many can we get to your school so that way when our student, that's an ASDB student and let's say a school district student, right? Because we're providing the service to the school district and that student has six teachers, how can we make sure that those teachers have that same shield so they're feeling safe, the student is safe, so they can actually read lips or see what's going on and what's happening with that. And we were able to do that to all of the requests that were there within, I think it was about five days, we got it out to every single school district who needed them. We actually gave every school district more than they requested so they started using it for office staff, for secretarial roles. So that way when students came into the office, they could see what the person is saying. I'm doing that and thinking outside the box with that. And we took pictures of all of them with their Amazon box. And we're gonna be sharing that with our board because they're excited to know how we distributed these statewide. And then our own staff made sure that they took those shields and provided it with each one of our students. And talking about transition and life skills, there is three components to put these shields together. So some of our teachers actually created that into a lesson and saying, well, if you were in the adult world and Amazon sent you this, you'd have to put it together. So let's talk about that. What does it look like? How do you put it together? How do you do it without breaking it? And those type of things. So it was some, a learning experience for our students as well. Um, and again, that went out statewide. Um, and Arizona is quite large, as you know, um, and that was able to do that. We do have some of our schools that are in person. We have some in the hybrid model. We have some that are online and some that are going to multiple schedules. The word that we've used internally with ASDB has been, we need to be flexible constantly because what happens this week may change next week um, or the week after that or whatever it may be. So our staff has worked really hard about being flexible on that to provide those services for kids um, around the state. But it was great having Amazon come in and provide those. It was just um, a wonderful experience of them doing that and then getting it out to everybody. Well, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure that they have lots to go around right now. I think um, <laughs> my front porch uh, looks like a warehouse sometimes yeah. when I come home. <laughs> like, what did I buy this time? 
it's usually books. I have a ton of books. I kind of have a book prob problem, um, but I think that's a good one to have. Um, but speaking of self-care, how are you doing your own self-care? Because you're, I think, let's see, I sent you an email the other night at two o'clock in the morning and you responded. And by the time I got it, it was very early for you too. So um, while we know it's important, um, you know, as a director with this weight, with, the, you know, wanting to do the best and, and, and the things that you're talking about are just incredible. And it takes a lot of dedication and leadership. Are you taking care of yourself? <laughs> Probably not as much as I should. I think we all are guilty of that. But I can tell you, you know, through the pandemic, one thing that my wife and I started doing, and in Arizona, it's still quite warm, believe it or not. In Tucson, I think it was about 101 degrees today or right around there. Um, so we've got to get up quite early to do this, but we've um, actually put it into our calendar and schedule to go out for a morning walk that's about three to four miles every day. And it helps, I think, her work as well as my own to really set ourselves for the day. So when I am returning emails at 3.30 in the morning, I take that break probably around 5, 5.30, so we can go out and do our walk. And it gives my, you know, I send the mindset to kind of move into that day. The one thing that I also think about a lot um, within self-care is that it's very different for different people as well as it may be different on different days. Um, that might be a walk that's all I need one day, but the next day I might need to do something in the middle of the day and just take time just to turn everything off for a while and just sit quietly in a room. Um, another thing that we do for self-care, which we haven't been able to do yet because it's been too hot because we're fair weather riders, is we ride motorcycles. And I can tell you that when you're on a motorcycle and you are not thinking about IEPs and parent emails or how do I contact the school, you've got to concentrate on everything around you and you can lose yourself in your own mindset with that because you're paying attention about not falling or hitting somebody. So that's a real powerful one for us. So take a motorcycle and just put that on a regular bicycle and me just going across the park to get to the high school where I teach. That takes all the mental pow power yeah. possibly have. Can be, I did right? not learn how to ride a bike until I was about 16 years uh, okay. old. Still no. not the most confident. So I don't know about the motorcycle. Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds yeah. great. I would love to, you know, ride, but, uh, but no, I, I can imagine. I, I, I also hear a lot from individuals that swimming is kind of the same thing yeah. where you're Very just focusing on your breath and so much of that self care, the mindfulness, it does come back to just taking time to breathe. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that, you know, when we're trying to do it all and say it all, and it's just, we don't, have that chance. Um, so we do have a couple of comments in the chat here. Um, so we are all in very, so we have people from Minnesota over here in New Jersey and Arizona. We're all experiencing much different climate. Um, but yes, all of the resources will be shared. Um, I will um, post them with the link. Um, I will, uh, there is some slide presentations, which are basically what um, Jay uh, shared. Uh, so uh, I will make sure that um, anybody here today uh, gets that because uh, it is all about connection. And if there's something that you missed or if you're pop popping in and you missed the first part and you feel like you don't have time to watch the whole thing, um, you know, let us know, reach out. Um, and uh, Jay, I don't know if um, you're okay sharing your Absolutely. email address and all yeah. that, because um, it is just so much about connection. It's about making sure that you know you're doing okay, and sometimes it just feels good to make sure the person next to you is okay too, and that way you're in it together um, and to check in on one another. Um, does anybody have any questions? We do have a few people out here, so I want to. While you're asking that, Rebecca, I'm going to share my screen once again yeah, so okay. they kind of see another um, resource that'll be in the slides. So this is obviously very similar to the self-care one that I showed you, 
But when we started looking at, I think you mentioned transition planning, as well as other things relative specifically for kids who are deaf, hard of hearing, or visually impaired, or blind, we started building this page internally. This is a much larger page, but everything that you can think of in the work that we would be doing, and believe it or not, we even put some links on here for Google, because some of the schools we work with, this was a new experience using a Google as a platform. So we wanted to provide resources to our team, and this actually got pushed out through those community practices I mentioned before. So we have this going out statewide for teachers that we have no idea are even using it, but we wanted to make sure that we built something that was usable. But there's a lot that's on here. As you can see, um, some of these we need to update the webinar training that was going on for UDL, but that's been a big push, as well as what CEC and CEDAR group put together and looking at the high leverage practices, we've combined our efforts with CEDAR as well as CEC to make sure we can provide that out to teachers too. So there's a lot that's on here, as you can see. We wanted to put it kind of in a fun place so that way teachers, when they're looking for something, they can find that work that's on there. Um, but one relative to transition I'll share that is a national group. Did my screen change where it says explore work now? Yes. Um, so this is free from WinTAC. WinTAC oversees, as one organization oversees, um, pre, that's the pre-employment skills training through VR. They built this page, which is 100% free. You don't get any pop-ups or anything like that, but a student would have to register in here. And once they register, what they do is there's different coursework that they take that enables them to look at different parts of the transition process um, and they would fill out information that's on here. I did a mock one for myself so I can kind of play with it, but it goes from everything from self care um, to career planning, working beyond high school. And what's really great is as they do one of these units, they can then email their work that they've done to a classroom teacher or to their parent um, and doing that and everything is inclusive in that login. So it saves all of their work. It is screen reader friendly. So our students that need screen readers can do it, um, as well as other folks that are in there using this. And this is good, I always say for any kid, right, that's in middle school, high school, but specifically built um, for our special education population. So I wanted to share that with you too. That is incredible. Yeah, I mean, universal design means that, you know, if it's good for one kid, it might help someone else too. And I, I always, advocate that special education teaching is not different it's just good practice being you know Im implemented very um cognizantly and um intentionally um you know there's a lot of things that all educators do but when you actually stop and think about you know, how you're delivering a lesson or how long you're pausing, like that could make it or break it for some, some kid. Um, that was another thing that Cornelius brought up in his speech, um, saying that they were providing closed, closed captioning and uh, they had um, a student, who, if somebody could I think somebody <laughs> make sure that you're on on mute right now thank you um but one of the other things is just that um you the kids in the room that didn't ha that weren't hard of hearing actually asked for the closed cap caption because it was helping them um i know myself um by the time i sit down to watch a movie with my husband it is after a very long day and the only way that we have found to keep myself awake is to put the captioning on because i feel like i'm reading and therefore being an active part of the um of whatever we're we're watching and i think that right. you know universal design is just that like the um you know when we're thinking about ada those wonderful curbsides that were put in um, to help those in wheel wheelchairs as a mom, do I love that for the stroller too? 
Um, so these people who have advocated so strongly uh, for um, our special needs, they have improved the lives of so many. Um, and I think that that's and really important to um, remember. Right. Um, we did have a question in here. Um, sure. From Deb, it says, as a school psychologist, we need to get updated cognitive and academic assessments completed at least triennially. This has been tough without being in person for some kids. How are you assessing students currently, in particular for students who are not in the school buildings or all remote? And that's a great question. One of the things that when we look at the co-op model and what we do, when we're receiving information from a school, it's because a student has already been placed um, in special education. They've failed two screenings on if there's a concern for hearing, or they may have an audiogram that's a little outdated and someone may bring it in suddenly to a brand new school district. So the question you're asking really goes back into our school districts and charters and they're handling it a lot of different ways. Um, so I would not speak as eloquently to that rather than a special education director because our work really begins in the co-ops once there's been a referral that's been submitted um, from a school district or charter to us as one of those partnering schools. That process has actually gone very well. Um, we have some students that were we said put in the hopper back in March, April of last year. And because of the pandemic, things were halted. But all of those students um, have been able to go through that process and starting either providing services for, from ASDB or some students were it was not impacting their learning. Um, one thing that we know is a child may have a hearing um, deficit and or a vision de deficit but does not mean they require specially designed instruction. It may be a student that requires a 504. It may be a student that may get along just fine um, with the hearing aids or something like that and supported by the school district or charter. So there's a lot of different moving parts to that. That's wonderful. Yeah, um, I just put that um, if you would like to stay connected, please share your emails in the chat. Um, if you are um, not yet a part of the learning revolution, um, anything that is shared um, during our presentations uh, is posted there as well, um, as well as some of the other shows that, while not special education related, uh, really focus on the innovation that we need to revolutionize education for the positive. Um, and shared something, I'd like to share it on the screen because uh, it goes back to something that we were talking about. Um, there was a national research study uh, for the student use and perception of closed captions and transcripts. And um, this kind of solidifies what I was mentioning. 98.6% of students find the captions helpful. Um, so it's just a wonderful thing um, to, to see how these accommodations um, are there and they help so many. Um, I know that I would be a student that um, definitely and benefited from that. Um, I think that as you're, you know, when you're in the special education world, you start to self-diagnose, but one thing that I noticed was that my husband laughs at jokes before I've even heard them. And I'm like, you either have supersonic hearing or I have some processing because he'll be laughing. And I'm like, wait, you laughed over, over the joke. I didn't hear it yet. Um, so it's interesting. And I think that's one of the reasons I'm like, you know what, like I, it, 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 it's helpful just to see it. Um, and I'm a visual person. So seeing the words there, helps me to comprehend because otherwise I think my mind gets distracted and I start thinking about my IEPs and my lists, you know? <laughs> um, so uh, that's just the name of the, uh, the game there. I believe that you could probably work 24 hours a day and you would still find something to do. Um, that is true in my first year of education. It is certainly true in my 12th year. Um, 
it is just, um, you know, I wanted to have a career that was different each day. I think I chose correctly, especially right now. Um, you know, I wanted to mention too, Rebecca, there's been some, a lot of independent studies done with closed captioning. Um, they've done some work where all teachers did at the elementary level was turn on closed captioning when showing a video in a classroom. It might be a video clip that went along with a science lesson or whatever it may be. And because of that one item and doing that one thing, they noticed that all the comprehension and reading comprehension of all students went up because they were forced to read as they were listening. So that's one that's really great. You know where that I, came from? You know what, I'd have to, I could connect, if there's anybody interested, drop me an email and I'll connect you with one of my counterparts uh, on the ADE side that I believe she has that research information that's out there. Um, if not, I'm sure she would know where to find it because she's one of the reading specialists um, that I know with ADE and she's well versed um, with literacy and doing that kind of work and I have a whole nother series of resources to use specifically for literacy but when we start thinking about you know UDL and just like you mentioned before it's good for all kids we know that if you turn on closed captioning during videos if you're showing that in a class you're increasing the reading comprehension for all kids yeah, ab absolutely. Um, so I, I cannot thank everyone here just so much for taking time on a Wednesday um, in such a hard time for so many. Um, and I, I have all of your emails. Um, when this gets published, I will send you the, the um, link for the video. Feel free to share it. I will send you the resources and please reach out. Um, additionally, I will put my own email in here for those of you who might have found me through uh, var varied ways. Um, but if there's something else that you feel like you really want to talk about that wasn't mentioned here today, if there is, you know, um, just something that you, you, you've been thinking about, we are not alone in this. Um, and I definitely feel more connected today after this uh, talk today with Jay, um, because the things that you were doing were the things that I was like hoping and praying were hap happening and weren't in my immediate vicinity. Um, so just know that there's always someone thinking similar thoughts and with the power of the internet and connection, you can find them. Um, so I thank you all so much, especially our interpreters. Um, if I could get, if Jay, if you could send, send me their uh, specific information, I, I, I would love to send a heartfelt welcome. So uh, thank you, Christina. Thank you to Lisa. Um, I wish you all a healthy, um, as stress-free as it could possibly be rest of the year. And I really hope that we get to connect again soon. Um, whether that be a Council for Exceptional Children event or if there's anything that, that Learning Revolution or myself can do for you, know that you have a new friend. And last thing I'll say, I shared our ASDB page, so feel free to find any of our information on there. The other thing is um, CEC is going virtual this year for their national conference. Um, I, along with a couple of my colleagues from CEDAR have been asked to present um, at that virtual conference. And we're gonna be talking about what we did last year, which was called Teach Camp for brand new special ed teachers in our state, as well as a separate project that came off of that called the Teacher Empowerment Project that we worked with special ed directors and special ed teachers to really design how do we support them in that first or second year. Of course, some of that work was halted during the pandemic, but we picked up right where we left off and we've already started moving that work forward. And we'll be presenting that at the CEC conference this year. Wonderful, that's great. Yeah, I really think mentorship, there is not enough books in the world to prepare you for when you walk in to a classroom. Um, there are so many, variations of 
needs and behaviors and personalities. Um, forget about the curriculum, right? Um, so I think that mentor uh, ship piece is, is fundamental um, for us to keep our educators in education. Um, yeah. I'm worried about that right now too, mm -hmm. in a big, big, big way. Um, is it camp teach or teach camp? I'm the, sorry. And it was called teach camp. Um, and we did that lot, not this last summer, but two summers ago, um, we had three teach camps in Arizona, one in Tucson, one in Phoenix and one in Flagstaff. And we had about 150 total teachers who attended and we did a three-day teach camp with them. Um, myself and another colleague um, led that work. And then with CEDAR, they also were a partner with that as well as CEC. Um, we gave them the book, The Survival Guide for the Special Ed Teacher, which is an amazing resource if you haven't had a chance to see that. It's a great first or second year book. We're using it this year with ASDB for our first and second year special ed teachers. And then CEDAR um, said that they wanted to do a bit more work with some of those students. So we picked three districts in our state, one rural, one inner city, um, and one kind of in the ruralish area a little bit, and one medium, small, and large. And we called that the Teacher Empowerment Project. And that work was done specifically with their special education directors, as well as the teachers who attended Teach Camp. And we talked about high leverage practices with them. We provided some mentorship to the teachers. And believe it or not, some mentorship to the special ed directors was one of those unintended consequences. And we actually drove a little bit farther down the road with that and found out some very interesting things um, that were happening in our field and how to support special ed directors so they stay in their role as well as our special ed teachers. So like I said, we'll be presenting some of that work and some of the data that we pulled from our teachers from that and what our plans are moving forward even after the pandemic, how do we keep that work moving forward? And CEDAR is leading that charge. The Arizona local CEDAR um, group is leading that charge, which That's I sit awesome. on that group too. That is just so wonderful. And it's all about connection. I can't say that enough. And um, I am going to give your night <laughs> back to you to Thank get you. done so much more. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I hope that you have some time to yourself and um, I'm going to stop recording. But if anybody would else would like to stay just to chat, I am available. Um, and I will hopefully see you online soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.